Good morning. <laughs> how are we doing today? No, look, I know it's a little early, but how are we doing today? Okay, that's what I like to hear. So the topic of today's talk, you know, it, it, this month's theme actually is, is tied to endurance. And uh, I'm going to share a song with you guys. It's kind of about like having the, the endurance and like having that, like, that faith in yourself to continue seeing through ideas even when they get hard. Um, and yeah, I, I'm going to, before I actually start, I, I'm going to ask for your help, all right? So when I'm pointing to you, I just want you to, to remember and say a word, all right? So I'm going to like divide the room into quadrants. Um, <laughs> for this first, this first quadrant, uh, I want you guys to remember the word excuses. Can you do that? The one I point, so excuses. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll workshop it. <laughs> um, this side, that's a lie, so lie. Okay, you guys in the corner, I'm not calling you this word, but just say it, stupid. <laughs> trust me, trust me, stupid. Okay, all right, all right. And then you guys in this cor corner, eyes. All right, so we're going to start the song now. And, uh, you know, remember, remember, remember when I point to you. We'll, work, we'll do it slow this first time. Heard it all before, I swear I'm done with your excuse. Told me we could make it work, but clearly that's a lie. You talk like a genius, but the way you act is stupid. Never good enough to face the word in your own eyes. Let me hear you say, heard it all before, I swear I'm done with your excuses. Told me we could make it work, but clearly that's a lie. You talk like a genius, but the way you act is stupid. Never good enough to face the word world in your own eyes okay all of this back and forth all of this running away from the problem who are you acting for i guarantee there's a few better options you push it down ignore you jump from one little thing to the next constantly hurt that it wasn't your best constantly hurting the ones you caress but really the truth is well i think you're terrified of a life where you no longer do this you can't keep it down inside when the struggle approaches that you quit Treat distractions like a warm blanket on a cold afternoon after a thankless day in a place you hate, I swear. You defeat yourself before anybody else even thinks of a way to debase you today or erase what you say, contemplate your mistakes for refusing to change. You stay stuck on this path where everything crumbles to pieces around you and you can't do nothing but sit back and laugh. You blame the world on your pain. Victim every single circumstance and someone else is always there to blame. But secretly there's like a hundred pounds of feeling you can't shake the weight of shame deep in your stomach. Beyond your analysis, finish what you start. Professor Calamity's heard it all before. I swear I'm done with your excuses. Told me we could make it work, but clearly that's a lie. You talk like a genius, but the way you act is too. Never good enough to face the word in your own eyes. I mean, you say heard it all before. I swear I'm done with your excuses. Told me we could make it work, but clearly that's a lie. You talk like a genius, but the way you act is stupid. Never good enough to face the word in your own eyes. I believe in you. The mirror getting easier to see into. On my evenings, I might want to leave the truth in the dust behind where I'm fleeing to. But this honestly feels better. What I needed from me was the courage to go make mistakes. I've been craving perfection, convinced I ain't had what it takes. And in that pain and avoidance, made some of the worst decisions possible. So please, heard it all before I swear I'm done with your excuses. Told me we could make it work, but clearly that's a lie. You talk like a genius, but the way you act is stupid. Never good enough to face the world in your own eyes. Heard it all before I swear I'm done with your excuses. Told me we could make it work, but clearly that's a lie. You talk like a genius, but the way you act is Never good enough to face the world in your own eyes. And so yeah, that song is called Genius. It's all about having the courage to see your ideas through and having that endurance to follow the passions that like come to you, because they matter. Thank you. My name is Roseblood, and that was my time. Thank you.
Rose, thank you for opening up today's event. That was just so wonderful. Can we give him one more, one more round of applause? Good Creative Mornings, everyone. My name is Tina Roth Eisenberg. I'm the founder of Creative Mornings and your New York City host. And I'm so sorry we're late. I'm Swiss. This is like really <laughs> painful to me. So I'm really, really sorry. We had a little bit of a scramble there, but we're here. And I want to also welcome everyone on live stream. Thank you for tuning in. We're so happy you're here. And who of you remembers the 30 second pitch wheel? Well, some of you, yeah. We're bringing the 30 second pitch wheel back. Um, some of you have bravely put their name into the pitch wheel. For those of you that don't know what this is, is at the end after the Q&A, after Michael's Q&A, uh, four of you can come on stage, you get the mic and you can pitch anything you want. If you're for hire, if you're hiring, if you have a class you wanna sell, if, if you're looking for love, I have a good story next month about someone who found love. Um, so uh, that's gonna happen and Casey's gonna come up and tell us who are the four people that were pulled from the pitch wheel. Casey, come on. The pitch wheel. Thank you all so much for putting your names in. The four folks who will be pitching today are Dev Macker. Is Dev in the house? I see you, Dev. I see you. Uh, looking for work and personal project. Look forward to that. We also have Aiden Road. Is Aiden in the house? Hey, Aiden. Jacqueline Greenstock. Where's Jacqueline? Hi, Jacqueline. And we have Justine Clay. Is Justine here? Justine? I hear you, Justine. All right, so get ready, you guys. You're going to be pitching after the talk. Thanks, guys. I want to thank Parsons for having us back. Um, when I was in high school, I dreamt of coming to Parsons. And uh, at the time, I couldn't convince my parents to let me cross the Atlantic. I get it, I get it, I'm a mom now too. And uh, eventually I moved to New York after I studied graphic design and I started teaching here. And that email felt so good when I sent my parents that email. I was like, remember that school I wanted to go to? I'm teaching there now. Anyway, I am super, super happy to be here. Like this is actually my favorite venue of all venues we've ever been in in 15 years. So Anthony, Dree, Mark, and Doc, the whole AV team, you make it so easy to be here, and it's just a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for hosting us. The last time we were in this room, and this is getting me all emotional, was on March 6, 2020. It was with Saki Havif as our speaker, and is anyone here today that was in that room that day? Oh my God, so many of you. None of us knew what is going to happen. Um, and I'm extra emotional because today is our 15th birthday. As you probably have realized, something's happening. Um, Because back in May of 2020, I was seriously wondering if Creative Mornings is going to su uh, survive uh, a pandemic. Uh, but it did because of the resilience of our incredible volunteers around the world and because of you, our audience, that made it very clear you want this thing to exist. Uh, I started Creative Mornings because I believe in the power of being in a room together, connecting our hearts. And now coming out of the pandemic, I actually think it's more important than ever and is a muscle that we have to train again. So kudos to you for all of you to come out. Um, when I started Creative Mornings in 2008 here in New York, I never, ever imagined it would grow beyond just a New York City uh, chapter. But here we are, we're a global force. And one of the fine humans that helped me build the systems that we needed for chapters to grow is my first hire, Kevin, uh, who I hired in 2010. Uh, for five years, Kevin helped me expand Creative Mornings from four to 111 chapters. Who, who here is an OG and remembers Kevin? So many of you. Um, I asked him to come back and do us the honor to read the manifesto. He said yes, he was really flattered. And then guess what? COVID. So he couldn't be here, but we adapt and uh, he sent a video. Oh, hello. Good morning. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action. 
honesty, and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Kevin is a big reason why we are what we are today. So let me know. I want to ask you a few things. This is my favorite thing to do. I feel very powerful when we play stand up. If I'm going to project some sentences to the screen, and if you can get up, if it applies to you, if you can't get up, just raise your arm. Uh, get up if this is your first event, first Creative Mornings event. Oh my God, this makes me so happy. Thank you for being here. I will hug you after the event if you want to know just how welcome you are. Um, stand up if you've been coming to Creative Mornings for more than 10 years. We're going to, to the other side. Look at you, so many. Damn. Stand up if you have attended Michael's, Michael Beirut's talk in 2010. There's a few of you, this is awesome. Um, Stand up if you are or have been a volunteer, venue, venue partner, or sponsored an event in the past. Uh, thank, stand up if you've been one of our speakers or have hosted a field trip, a virtual learning series. Awesome, thank you. Stand up if you've made a friend at Creative Mornings. This is, this is winning. This makes me so happy. <laughs> you know, I started Creative Mornings because I couldn't find my people. I didn't know where they were. So now at least you're finding yours. Great. Um, stand up if you've been to an other chapter event somewhere. Who thinks they've been to the furthest away? Shout it. South Africa. Oh, OK. We're done. We're done. <laughs> South Africa. Thank you. Um, Stand up if you've been wondering how we are able to put on free events around the world. <laughs> wow, some of you are just like, of course. <laughs> like, that's funny. Well, actually, you're not the only one who wonders that and asks us. I sometimes do too, but you know, there, it's because of the thousand plus volunteers and hosts around the world who lovingly donate their time and pour their love and heart into their local communities and put on these events and because of generous venue partners like Parsons and sponsors who help us uh, cover the cost. And I wanna thank our local partners for their support and for making all of this happen. First off, there's Harvest, just like us. They're a New York City-based company and our favorite time tracking tool. I feel like they've done something that is really dry and can be really painful, very easy to use and delightful. So if you have to track time or track expenses, check them out. Thank you, Danny, at Harvest. And then big thank you to MPB. We love them so much. If you don't know what MPB is, they make it super easy to sell or buy used photography and video equipment. So if you have some old lenses or gear hanging around, put them on their site, sell them, or if you want to upgrade, go to mpb.com. They're the nicest people ever. So thank you so much, MPB. And then a big thank you to 1Password, a software that gives me personally a lot of peace of mind. I've been using them for so long, I can literally not remember not having them in my life. It's a total lifesaver. Um, as a creatively minded human, the last thing I want to think about is like the safety of my passwords and cybersecurity. I use it for both personal and for you know, sharing our passwords within my company. So love one password. And also they're really wonderful humans, which is the best part. And then last but not least, I want to thank Microsoft Teams for um, helping us test and prototype how our local community, you guys, can find each other in between events. Um, if you join our Creative Mornings team space, you can share your work, classifieds if you're looking for help. Um, and for example, here pictured we have Jeffrey Ramirez trying to find volunteers to has test his card game. How cool is that? Um, so if you're not on the app, app yet, um, look on that postcard that was on your seat and how to get on it and share what you have to offer. All right, gift break. <laughs> I really want a Roomba so my cat can cruise around. 
Anyway, so uh, here's a fun fact. We're, um, we're a global organization with chapters in 67 countries, but Creative Mornings came close to shutting down in 2010. Very few people know this, but I was planning on stopping the New York City chapter, which was the only chapter in 2010, when I was pregnant with my son, my second kid. And I just couldn't see how I could handle running my design studio, two little kids, and hosting events. So I decided to go out with a bang. I boldly decided to ask my, at the time, dream speaker, Michael Beirut, to speak. And very much to my surprise, I asked him at an AIG event, and he just looked at me, he's like, yes. And I was like, oh, OK. And then a little later, he emailed me and goes, what do you want me to talk about? And I'm like, what the heck? You're Michael Beirut. And, and I was like, you know, do your thing. And he's like, no, 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 Tina, what do you want? And I had a really bad client interaction day that day. And I was like, well, if you ask me right now, clients. And he's like, and he, I never heard anything again. And then the, the morning off, he walks in and he goes, I made a brand new talk on clients. And I was like, oh, it's such a good and timeless talk. If you haven't seen it, look it up. So anyway, his talk was so good, he packed Galapagos. Yes, we used to host at a nightclub. Um, <laughs> he gave this incredible talk. And then, guess what? Everyone comes up to me, this was awesome. When's the next event? Who are you going to have next? And I stood there like deer in headlights, like, I can't stop running this. So thanks, Michael. <laughs> I think we really have reason to celebrate because today we have a whopping 27,000 attendees get together IRL for the events or on our virtual field trips every month. And I want to thank all of our hosts around the world, our volunteers, our field trip teachers, our speakers, our partners, my HQ team for contributing to this wonderful engine of generosity. I personally believe that creativity is a discipline of optim optimism. And in order for all of us to call in a more nourishing and heart-centered world, we have to operate from a place of love and not fear, which is hard to find these days. Um, I personally hope that our Creative Mornings events are a consistent, reliable drip, uh, showing us how, um, how kind, loving, and joyful life can actually be. I secretly hope that our events make you drop into your hearts, make your nervous system relax a little bit, make you feel a bit more optimistic, and let, let you hear the whispers of your hearts. So, drum roll please. I'm so very excited to introduce Michael Beirut. And thank you, One Password, for creating this speaker slide for us today. Some of you book lovers might recognize what it's ahead not to. Um, Michael, re oh, Michael really doesn't need an introduction. Um, in my book, he's a living legend. Uh, he has been a celebrated graphic designer for over 50 years. Uh, his first job after graduating from University of Cincinnati was with no other man than Massimo Vignelli, where he worked for a decade. And then he became a partner at the New York office of Pentagram, where he's celebrating his 33rd anniversary. Please give a rock star round of applause for the remarkable Michael Beirut. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I, I, that picture of Galapagos was so funny because I remember it's going into a Brooklyn nightclub at like nine in the morning. It was like I, like I, that was the moment I sort of won I wondered whether this was going to survive actually. So it just seemed like a weird, weird idea. But hey, it worked. And and nothing gives me more satisfaction than getting even one percent of credit for all the hard work that Tina and her crew actually have done to make this happen. So I don't deserve even a tenth of one percent, but thank you, Tina, for inviting me back to celebrate uh, 15. It's amazing. Um, uh, and uh, she, I remember back in uh, 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 2010 when, we, when I did that talk, um, she said, why don't you talk about clients? And it's just so happened that I've been thinking about it a lot myself. And um, so it was a great coincidence. I was interested in it and I sort of like thought, okay, this is a chance to think about that. So this time, she said, the theme is endurance. And um, it's, that's been something I've been thinking about a lot lately as well. Um, and I had done a talk, I don't know, like about eight, nine, ten years ago. 
And I was in my, um, it was about being old, basically. I, I'm not sure how explicit I was about it, but I realized I was like, the oldest speaker at a conference, and I sort of thought, um, okay, I'm, I'm okay, right? Everything's okay? Okay. Uh, I, I was feeling self-conscious, and I thought, like, old guy comes out, what, you know, what, who cares? And so I sort of like was musing about that and feeling sorry for myself. And I thought, and I, I must have been like, what, 54. So I'm, I'm now in my late 60s. And so like I, I was sort of prematurely worrying about getting old. Now I don't have to do that anymore because I am like <laughs> fucking old. So, um, so I, I had done a talk back then that was supposed to be about wisdom in a way. And um, I looked back and it sort of like didn't have, it had some wisdom, but not that much. So I sort of said, I'm going to try to get this right for you guys this morning. So I'm an old guy. Here, are, here is some wisdom, perhaps. Okay, so hello. This is what I've learned um, over my uh, life so far. Um, Michael Barut, I'm 66 years old. I got a thing during the pandemic. It was a real moment. Uh, I got this envelope from the Social Security Administration that said, um, you may be thinking about retiring. Here's the steps that you would go through to qualify for your social security benefits. And I have to admit, I was sort of like dumbstruck by this. Uh, it was, you know, and, and not only that, but they, you get a very customized thing. They sort of list every year you earn money going back to when I was doing internships in college. And, it's, and they tell you exactly how much you would get if you retired every month. Um, it's, it's not bad, actually. Um, you know, sort of, I, I was sort of like thinking, well, I guess they want me to begin thinking about this now. Uh, the government does, so I'm sort of like trying to be a good citizen. So I started thinking about my life so far, and a lot of that thinking has gone into what I'll talk about this morning. Um, so I was born in 1957, the same year that um, Helvetica was designed, actually, but who's <laughs> kind of, <laughs> So we're both old, I guess. Um, um, and, I, and these are some of the things I learned sort of along the way. I was a quiet, introverted, nerdy kid. I, I was a little bit bookish, if a, can, if a first grader can be bookish. But um, I sort of was, I like wasn't good at sports. I didn't have what you call riz uh, as a first grader, <laughs> I believe. Uh, and, um, uh, um, but then one day, um, I think the teacher to kill time was raining outside, and uh, Mrs. Canola said, um, why doesn't everyone in, uh, in the class just draw something that they see in the room? And I drew what, I drew like a really detailed drawing. I remember still, it was, I don't have it still, but it was like a, uh, uh, you know, the flag in the corner, the window showing the playground outside. I sort of really drew it fairly faithfully, you know, as a six or seven year old could. And um, Mrs. Canola was impressed and sent it home to my parents with a note saying, it looks like Michael has the makings of a real artist. And my parents, I think, reacted to this with like a bit of alarm because they, uh, I grew up in a, a suburban Cleveland uh, where the main cultural center of my town was the bowling alley, probably. Uh, and, um, um, and like they didn't know any artists or even like this sounded, this actually sounded like, um, uh, uh, what's the word for it? A, um, like I'd been diagnosed with something that would need special <laughs> attention. And so um, they, um, luckily they, a, a friend of theirs had a, like, a, a, like one of my, cousins several times removed, actually was going to art school, was going to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. So they said, um, could we ask, could, could you ask um, her like what we should do with Michael, with, you know, what should be done with Michael? Uh, and um, with Mike, as they call me. And, um, and she said, well, you know, the Cleveland Museum of Art has Saturday morning art classes. And so my mom, God bless her, got in her Ford Falcon with me every Saturday morning and drove from the southwest suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, to the beautiful, extraordinary Cleveland Museum of Art shown here, which um, I don't think she had ever been in before in her life. Um, uh, and, but she sort of like walked me in there, and I started taking these Saturday morning art classes for kids. And, um, you know, just, just like um, uh, Tina was saying, you know, you've, all of a sudden you find your people. Um, you know, I, I went from this place that, like, I was never, I've never been good at bowling, for instance, and that was, seemed to be something that uh, the, the adults around me seemed interested in. But on the other hand, I went in here and it just was surrounded by all these things that had this, you know, power and, and, and inspirational, just, just beauty in a way. And um, um, so I started taking these classes, and one of the exercises was, um, 
they would show you a painting and you'd have like whatever drawing tools you have and they say you know try to draw what you see in this painting and so uh, one of them is the um, uh, uh, painting called the burning of houses of lords and commons by uh, uh, jmw turner 1834 it's really one of the most beautiful things in their collection i don't have that drawing from uh, first grade but i do have the drawing i did of that at the, at the age of seven and um, on the back of it, it says The Burning of Houses of Lord and Commons by Michael Beirut, age seven. Uh, <laughs> so, I, so for the first time, and not the last time, I put my name on work that actually was inspired very much by someone else and uh, um, maybe setting in, in, in motion a lifelong um, bad habit of mine. But so um, uh, and then I learned, like, knowing how to draw, I had a certain kind of status. People would say, oh, you, you, you drew that? Like, it's sort of... You know, if people who otherwise would be inclined to either ignore me or maybe even beat me up on the playground sort of saw that I had some magic utility somehow. I was able to uh, uh, to draw things, and so some you know I, I wasn't good at sports, I wasn't good at a lot of things, but knowing how to draw actually gave me a minimum amount of status in a world where I felt like I otherwise had none. Um, but I sort of like also thought, well, you know. The, um, you know, this long drive to the art museum was this weird sort of daunting repository of this realm of art. And the idea, like, I didn't feel like that was my destiny to be in that museum. I could sort of, like, tell that. So um, I had this second revelation a few years later, and uh, it's like a very keen, clear childhood memory of um, being driven to get my hair cut by my dad on Granger Road in Garfield Heights, Ohio. And we stopped at an intersection and my dad pointed at a construction site and said, that's really clever. And this is a um, simulation of that experience. This is not, he didn't take a picture of it. I found this online. Um, but he said, um, and I said, what? And he said, well, look how neat it is. You see on the side of the truck the way they wrote Clark? And I'm like, yeah. Then he said, it's a forklift truck. And they did the L, so it's kind of lifting up the A. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> it's like, is, like, and then I'm like, it, you know, who else knows about this, you know? <laughs> and like, I was so electrified by this. And of course, you know, I think, um, um, kudos for my dad, right? Um, like this is now, this is like the, did you know there's an arrow in the FedEx logo kind of moment. But this was like a pretty subtle thing. And I remember thinking, um, I can't paint like Turner, but whatever this is, you know, I, I'd love to figure out how to do this. And like, and, and like, you know, you didn't have to go to an art museum for it. It's just like they're in a construction site, you know, a little bit of beauty, a little bit of joy, a little bit of magic. And it's right there. How do you do that? Who does that? I had no idea. Um, but I sort of like realized then that art had a kind of utility, like it stopped you from getting beat up on the playground perhaps, also could raise your grade in a way. So um, this is a report I did in the sixth grade on the um, uh, Titanic, well in advance of uh, James Cameron. I was kind of catching the <laughs> Titanic wave, if you will. Um, June 2nd, 1969, an outstanding report a plus underlined twice, says Miss McDonald. Um, and I think it was not only the excellence of the research I had done on the subject, but these detailed, fantastical drawings I did with a big pen uh, at my kitchen table in my house, sort of. And you can sort of see how much I love drawing clouds and how uneasy I felt about drawing drowning people. Uh, <laughs> So you sort of have, and I, that iceberg is done with a lot of tender, loving care, too. Rooting for the bad guy in the picture, I suppose. Um, and so I think what I was learning was that there was this other thing that wasn't art specifically. And the thing that wasn't art was something that could, you, that could be classified as design. And because I had this reputation, a moment came when I was about 15 years old where uh, the kids from the drama club said to me, um, hey, Mike, could you draw the poster for the play? And I went to a, um, a vocational high school, meaning half of the kids went to college, the other half, probably more than half, ended up just skipping college, going right into some sort of a, um, a trade. And we had a big print shop in the basement. And so whatever I designed was going to be given to the kids who were doing uh, vocational training in the printing, uh, the arts of printing and reproduction. And uh, um, uh, so I did a piece of artwork and then turned it over to the drama club. They in turn gave it to the printing guys and they went in the basement. And then I came in the next Monday 
And the play was called Wait Until Dark. And I sort of like faithfully read the play. What's this all about? And it's about, it's, it's about a, a, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie or has actually seen the play. It's about a blind woman being threatened by some bad guys. And it's, it's got a great, like, holy cow moment in the third act that I won't spoil for you. But it's, it's, if you see this movie, it's really good. Um, and um, um, I, I sort of like took a you know, felt tip marker and a piece of cardboard and I drew this. They took it in the basement and made like a hundred of them. And I came in on Monday morning and this poster was on every door, on every floor in my school. And my name's not even on it. And I was like, I, I sort of was just electrified by this. And I sort of thought, you know, I'm not sure like how, how much of a big deal uh, J.M.W. Turner is. Uh, who painted the Bernie the House of the Lords and Commons, but there's only one of those hanging way downtown. I've got a hundred of these suckers all over the school. More people are going to see this poster than would actually see the play. Then I, then like, then I sort of got to go to the cast party with the drama kids who were all there, who had real charisma, by the way. And so, like, all of a sudden I realized, oh, wait a second, you know, this is a point of entry into all these different worlds, and all you have to do is be enthusiastic, get interested in the play, figure out a way to do something that makes people go to the play and people will sort of like um, uh, figure out a way to bring you into their world. And so the idea that this art could go anywhere, you didn't have to go to a museum or a gallery, it could just be taped to a, um, you know, to the door of the gym in your school, really sort of like seemed like, I sort of think this is what I want to do. But I couldn't figure out like, remember, remember or not remember, but you may have heard that there was no internet back then. So like, and I didn't know a single person who did this for a living, or even that it was possible to do this for a living. This was all sort of like, you know, this weird thing that I sort of like was thinking was cool and interesting. And as nearly as I could figure out, my idea was that somehow, um, like real artists who did work that would be in the Clean Museum of Art would be approached by people like the kids in the drama club. And they would say, Mr. Turner, we're putting on a show. Could you stop painting that oil painting and just do a poster with the price and the time and everything on it? And if he needed the money, he would say, okay, sure, and do it, then go back to doing real art. And I didn't care about the real art at all. I just wanted to do the thing for the drama club. And um, I had no idea what this was. And then I, I love libraries, it, like a true nerdy introverted bookworm. My happy place was going to a library and just looking at books and looking up books. Um, and I found this book that changed my life at the age of 17. It's called Aim for a Job in Graphic Design Slash Art by Neil Fujita. And this, I opened it up and it was exactly what I wanted to do for a living. Fujita, who some of you may have heard of him, but if you haven't, he, des he designed the Columbia Records logo and most famously, a bunch of book covers, including the cover of The Godfather by Mario Puzo, which is basically the logo for the movie The Godfather. And so, you know, uh, he had real, um, you know, th th this was the voice of authority. He put together a book, maybe because he was, um, he was, uh, of ja he was Japanese American, and his parents had been in had been in uh, uh, internment camps during World War II. He really took pains to make the people he featured in the book really inclusive. So I remember there were black graphic designers, women graphic designers, Asian graphic designers, and it just sort of seemed like, wow, this is like like something that so many different people could do and make different contributions from their own points of view. So what's funny is that this book is part of a series, is part of the Aim High vocational series. See that? at the top. And so other things, if, you, if graphic design wasn't your thing, perhaps a career as a barber or bank, or banking, then barber. It's sort of like, I can't admit these two books were right next to each other. Yeah, I think I might want to be a banker. Oh, oh, on the other hand, I do like cutting hair. So I'm like, I don't really know how much play the other books got, but I sort of, um, um, this book really did change my life because it put a name to the thing that I wanted to do. I told my guidance counselor the thing I want to do is graphic design. She wrote it down really carefully, found out that in my very state of Ohio, I'll be at the other end of the state in Cincinnati, there was a, a program that was a, uh, master's of sci uh, a bachelor's of science in graphic design at their School of Design, Architecture, and Art. And so I enrolled there in 1975. And that's where I sort of like learned how much I had to learn, basically. Because I sort of, I was, I was at this point far and away the best artist in my high school. And, and then kind of arrived down at, uh, at college 
college, thinking, stand back, the best artist from Parma, Ohio is here. Uh, you know, and then they, you know, all, the, all my teachers said, mm -hmm, yeah, why don't you just draw, practice drawing these, moving these circles around in a square for a few months, and then let us know how that works out for you. So I had a lot to learn down at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I was, uh, you had to take photography, you, um, you know, I learned about doing hand-lettered typography. This isn't hand-lettered, this is probably uh, um, dry transfer lettering, I'm guessing. Um, <clears throat> but um, the thing that was actually most daunting for me, because like so many people into the arts, I wasn't necessarily enthusiastic about math. And in those days, in order to really, the hardest thing about being a graphic designer was this thing called copy fitting. And that was almost every job that I was gonna work on when I went into the professional field would have a moment where someone would give you a typewritten manuscript and say, this is the text that's gonna go in the thing you're designing. And then you'd have to figure out what size to make that text and what typeface so it would fit in the space you had designed for it. Now, nowadays, you guys, you know, it happens just immediately on your screen as you're specifying, you know, different line lengths and uh, uh, how much the line spacing is, what the typeface is, and you have the absolute freedom to manipulate things. In those days, you would kind of like take a piece of manuscript, mark it up in a red pen, send it to a typeface, Typesetter, they would do it overnight, then they'd send it to you. Then you'd find out if you had calculated it right. And it cost money to do this. And it was sort of like if you did it wrong, you sort of just wasted the money. And so to support you in this effort were all these things like this that was sort of like the designer's friend in the mid-70s. So these are all, this book was filled with like names of typefaces, different sizes, and then if how, how much space they occupied if they put them in a certain thing and you had that yellow ruler and you could figure out from that. So I thought I was getting into a world where I'd just be doing nothing but like posters for Broadway shows and album covers and instead I'm doing math for some reason. But like everything else, I, I, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that I was uh, you know, suffering or martyr. All of you guys, no matter what age you are, there's part of what you do creatively that involves mastering some craft aspects of the work. And your ability to kind of internalize those and do them almost intuitively is what liberates you to be creative. And so I spent you know, a good 10 years of my early life learning how to do these things that liberated me creatively, and none of these things are necessary to do anymore. So I have all these skills that basically no one cares about, the ability to do this. Uh, seems like a miracle, but no one cares anymore. But the way you actually learn is, and everyone I think knows this, is by having mentors. And what people think is that you sort of have to have a formal agreement with a mentor. You have to go to a mentor and say, um, I am a protege, I'm looking for a mentor, would you like to be my mentor? And then that person would sort of, you know, assess, assess their own schedule and their interest in having how many protégés and whether you might fit the, uh, the bill and, um, uh, and then they might assent to it or not. I'm like, don't worry about that. Just sort of like pick out the mentors and just be a protege, whether they know it or not, whether they are interested or not, whether they even know you're alive. So I have been a protege of people whose work I admire online, who I've read the writings of and studied the work of. They don't, they've never even heard of me or even know that I care about them. You know? And then I was lucky, though, because, as Tina said, when I moved to New York, my very first job was for one of my design heroes, a guy named Massimo Vignelli. I had done a field trip to New York when I was in high school in 1974. All my other um, uh, um, classmates had come back with a bunch of souvenirs of their trip to New York. I only had one souvenir, and it was this object. And I, I went back to Parham, Ohio, and I pinned this on the wall of my bedroom. And th this was sort of like, one day I will be here. And I just thought one day I would be in New York, but I didn't know that one day I'd actually be working for the guy that designed this map. And that was Massimo Vignoli shown here. Um, he, you know, he was an extraordinary person to work for. Again, very, very charismatic, but also extremely experienced, very opinionated, warm, uh, um, uh, generous with his time, loved design, loved designers. I often noticed that he would defend the lowliest intern against a client because clients weren't designers and the interns would have the status because they were designers even if they were still in school. And that was something I, rem I remember taking that on and thinking, you know, 
again, you sort of look, look for your people and you sort of look for people who sort of are reflecting values that you feel you could learn from. And I, I learned so much working for Massimo Vignelli over those 10 years. One of the things I learned was that um, if you design something bad, it doesn't matter if it's on time and on budget, if it's bad. And I remember I was like, after I'd been wor working there, as Tina said, I worked there for 10 years, and I'd been working there for three or four years, and I was at a point where I was kind of managing little projects myself. And there comes a time when, you, if you're managing projects, where you get really involved with kind of mastering the schedule and the budget and all these other things, and you sort of don't, and you know, people will make revisions and. We just showed it to someone, could you move this thing there? And we showed it to someone else, and they said that color means bad luck in some country, and so could he do this? And I was like, can do, chief. You know, I, I'm, I got it all under control. I'm a pro now. And I remember I was, I was doing this thing, and Massimo came over to my desk and said, what is this? And I said, you know, this is that thing uh, for so-and-so. And he said, why does it look this way? He said, well, you know, they showed it to this person. He said, no, this is horrible. He had a fantastic Italian accent, by the way. He said, this is horrible. Why would you do like this? And, uh, and I said, Massimo, it's like, it's, but it's due tomorrow. And I've already, I, he said, no, no, I, 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 we, can't, this, we can't do this. And so then he, like, at my desk, he called up, like, the boss of all the people I've been dealing with and said, listen, it's Massimo, we got this thing we're working on, and Michael's done a good job, but I think we can make it a little bit better. We got a little bit more time with it. Then he hung up, he said, no, we got more time. Let's, then let's go figure out how we fix this thing. And, and, then, and then I said, um, and he said, listen, then he said these words to me, right? And, and there's another way he used to say this, which is actually more profound. I don't have a picture of any of this shit I was working on, by the way, sorry. Uh, so the only way to do good work is to do good work. And sometimes someone would say, do this bad thing, do this crummy thing for us and there'll be a good thing in the future. Or do this crummy thing and you'll make some money. And he just said, if you do crummy things, you'll just get more crummy things. And you become the expert at doing crummy stuff that people bring you crummy things to do. If you want to do good work, do good work. Put the good work out there and more good work will come. And what was funny was he had a very specific idea about what good work was, which is work that looked like Massimo Vignelli had done it, right? Um, and, but I sort of realized it could be good by any definition, by any, like there could be 200 different, different definitions of what good was and all of them are valid. But I still think that regardless of what your work is, what your creative direction is, how you care to express yourself, this is true for you. So. Um, I got very interested in kind of like learning the names of typefaces, getting into colors and stuff, and I sort of lost track of the thing that I first was enthusiastic about, which, which was that um, Clark logo, which, you know, there's a typeface and something, but there's an idea in it that my dad pointed out as being memorable, right? And I think there comes a time sometimes when you're mastering the craft that the craft sort of seems like the point. And uh, this was... Um, I was 26 years old, I'd been working on this project with this client where everything we did for them was uh, PMS, super warm red, and Bodoni typography. And it was a design center that was doing two different events. One was a symposium by avant-garde furniture designers, and the other event, which was happening about a week or two later, was a presentation by engineers from NASA about how you design for zero gravity and, uh, you know, uh, outer space, basically. And I, these are two juicy things, avant-garde furniture, outer space. I was really into the idea that I could do two great invitations. Then they called me up and said, we, we budget just got cut. We can only do one invitation, so combine those two things. And I remember I tried to talk them out about it on the phone. I said, this will never work. I hung up the phone. I was a little bit mad. I did this, and then I just said, drew, drew something, and I said, they, they expect me to do something like this. And I drew this um, end table with a pot of flowers on it. And then if you turn it upside down, it's a rocket ship. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I remember, and it's red, like everything else we designed for them. And it's in Bodoni, like everything else we designed for them. But those two things, it doesn't matter what color it is or what the typeface is. It doesn't even matter whether that drawing is any good, because the idea is the thing that's memorable. I remember I took this home and I showed it to my lovely wife, Dorothy, and I said, I think I just designed the best thing I've ever designed in my life. I showed it to her, and she said, and she said who did this drawing? And I said, well, I did. She said, who are you going to get to do the drawing? And I said... <laughs> I said, we don't have any budget to get someone really to do it. So at any rate, um, I've been talking a lot about Massimo, and I've been talking a lot about budgets, who needs them, deadlines, they don't matter. But a business does not long survive on that philosophy. 
And um, Massimo used to do presentations like this one, and someone would raise their hand and say, Mr. Vignelli, your partner is Layla Vignelli, who he was married to, and in fact, it was called Vignelli Associates, and they were co-partners um, running the firm. And um, uh, Layla tended to take the lead in, th in three-dimensional interior design, architecture, product design work. Massimo was more about graphic design, but they collaborated all the time. And Massimo used to say, you know, in our office, um, we, we have a great collaboration because I'm like the engine and Layla's the brakes. And, uh, and like, I remember thinking, yeah, the engine, that sounds cool, you know. Uh, everyone wants to be the engine, propulsive, going forward all the time. And then I remembered something my driver's ed teacher had told me, which was that you don't die because the car doesn't start, you die because the brakes fail. And so Layla really was the person that kept that office alive for as long as it was. She was the one that would say, Ma, she had a different, slightly, she had a fantastic accent. Both of them have passed away, I miss both of them dearly. Ma, she would say, Ma, Simo. You and Michael have been spending so long on this stupid project. It has no budget. And so, and, uh, and so he, she'd say, but dude, it's fantastic. This is great. Don't you see how good it is? You know, so they'd be these are, then they revert to speaking Italian, and I would just kind of like, wait. You know. <laughs> but it was like yeah, having these double mentors representing two different sides of what the profession could be was so thrilling for me. And so I worked there way longer than I planned. I thought I'd be there for 18 months and move on. I worked there for a little bit more than a year, up to the age of 33. And then I went in and resigned because I had been talking to some friends who worked for a place called Pentagram. And um, I always wanted to be partners with someone. And I realized I could, no matter how long I worked for Massimo Leila, I couldn't be their partner. I felt like I was their adopted son. It, wasn't, it just wasn't meant to be. Whereas at Pentagram, there were some people that were closer to my age, people like Woody Pirtle and then Paula Scher, people like that. They were a little bit older than me, so I looked up to him as like big brother, big sister, but I, I felt like I could relate to him a little bit more. And so um, at the age of 33 in, in October 1990, 33 years ago, I, um, I joined Pentagram as a partner in the New York office. Um, Pentagram. Uh, you know, it's set up like a um, collaborative collective where each of the partners runs their own little design group within this system. I am in the back of that vehicle there. You'll spot some famous designers scattered around there. I joined at the same time as Peter Saville, who some of you might know. That's him in the uh, front seat there, passenger side. Um, he bailed after about 18 months, and I'm still in there 33 years later. You decide who made the right decision. Um, <laughs> And I was one of the youngest partners there. This is a picture taking a partners meeting uh, a year or so ago, and I am now one of the oldest partners there. So that happens, right? Um, and um, just to, Pentagram is an interesting thing because unlike Vignelli, where a lot of things were red, a lot of things were Bedoni, and everything was meant to sort of like uh, represent the vision of a single person or a single couple, the Vignellis, at Pentagram is a million different things. And so there's a little, there's a short like 60 second little clip that kind of gives you a taste of the work that's been done over the 50 years since it was founded. It was founded back, it was founded almost exactly at the time I was doing that Wait Until Dark poster. And so it had been around since then. I joined it uh, 18 years into its life and it's 53 years on now. So this was <laughs> There have been about 50 or so partners that have passed through the system since uh, it was founded, so this is all of their work, and uh, I represent um, 
two percent of it, I guess, if you're counting. So there you go. Um, and when I joined, I sort of had gotten pretty good at talking because I had to do a lot of translating for the Vignellis. And uh, when I joined Pentagram, all of a sudden I found that I had really smart people I could listen to around me. And so I started. Um, uh, I had started this habit of carrying around these notebooks that I just would take to every meeting and write down what I was hearing, and I still have them this day. I'm on notebook number 138 now. Um, and um, you know, you sort of like, it's listening that, that helps you learn, not making speeches. So, um, And then th what I had learned back in, um, uh, uh, in high school with the drama class ends up being the whole thing that I think is so fun about design is that it's like a license to trespass. You can go anywhere. You can convince people that if they think they need graphic design, you can say, well, I'm going to have to really investigate things. So um, along the way, I have sat in the newsroom of the New York Times because I claimed that I needed to do so in order to design the bathroom signs in their building. <laughs> Um, I worked with a guy named Errol Morris on this big murder mystery book, so I got all the ins and outs of trying to unravel a, uh, uh, you know, a crime that happened uh, back in the 70s. Um, I'm not really a huge sports fan, but we did all the branding for the New York Jets, and I got to go to the locker room and uh, have uh, distant encounters with actual football players. Uh, uh, um, we redesigned the parking signs here in New York, so I got to go to the um, place where they actually make parking signs uh, in New York City, out in uh, out in Queens. And um, and you know, I'm not I'm not good at math, not good at science, but I got to hang out at places like MIT, pretending I was and having some sort of expertise that they valued. And I think all of this goes to a point. Oh, I, you know, I got involved with politics and got to sit in a room where people, where I was sort of this oddity coming in and talking about colors and shapes, and then they would revert to talking about uh, polling and, uh, you know, and policy. Um, and so like, what I found is you design best when you're interested in the subject matter. So for instance, the, the designers I work with, I make sure, I, if I say we have to go to Queens to the shop where they make the parking signs, if I'm not working with someone who doesn't think that's the coolest thing to do, no one gets to do that, we get to do that, then you can tell people, guess where I was today. Now there are some people who think, I didn't get into this to go to some smelly place where they make parking signs. And th that's fine, but like that's not me, and I don't, I don't think that that's, I think you design best when you're interested in what you're working on. So the gimmick is to be as interested in as many things as possible. So if you're can be interested in parking signs and politics and football and all these things, you'll, I promise you, you'll be a better designer. Um, and so like, you know, I care about libraries, so along the way for a local uh, philanthropy, I designed, helped design 60 libraries for high schools, all public high schools all over the city, and the only thing that kept us going through that is the fact that I just thought, you know, everyone, this is a library. We have to make it as special as possible. We would talk other people into it, like Christoph Neiman, who did all these illustrations here. Um, and then at the same time, as I was going along, I was getting bigger and bigger jobs, but um, there are no small jobs, actually. Every job is an important job. And uh, back in uh, uh, 2000, we got a reminder of that when this woman named Teresa Lepore, uh, not a designer, but was given the task of laying out, of, of actually doing copy fitting, trying to figure out how to get all this stuff to fit on a ballot in Palm Beach County, Florida. And um, I won't go into the details, but it's designed so that um, you might think you were voting for Democrat Al Gore, but by accident, you might vote for uh, uh, independent candidate Pat Buchanan. And in so doing, you end up uh, giving the election in Palm Beach County to George W. Bush. And uh, if you've heard about the recount that they did in Florida, it all comes down to this ballot, it all comes down to someone making decisions about how type fits on a piece of paper. A little job that uh, is just black and white, crappy little job that uh, uh, beneath most of us, I would guess, but it ended up sort of changing the course of the world, I would argue. So design counts in that regard. Um, and I don't think talking is important, but I do think writing is a way to think things through. So along the way, I started writing, and I encourage people to kind of write things down. It doesn't have to be books. It can really, it can be threads on threads, or it can be Instagram captions, or it can be anything. But I think being able to write and compose words together is not important for a lot of design disciplines. I think for graphic designers, it actually help us, helps us be empathetic to the stuff we're working with as designers. 
And then likewise, I think um, you learn a lot if you're privileged enough to be a teacher. Uh, Tina talked about how electrifying it was to be invited to, ta to teach at Parsons, and um, I got um, offered um, uh, a position as an adjunct up at the Yale School of Art. And um, I'm not a good teacher. I don't have the stamina to really follow through on these really long-term projects. I'm good at kind of giving a prompt and just seeing what happens. And the one I came up with that actually sort of stuck was this thing called the 100 day project where I just would say everyone do something for 100 days. Talk about endurance, this is just purely about endurance because no matter what it is you pick, you think you can do it, then by day 11 you're thinking I can't take it anymore, then there's a point in the next 10 days where you're about to drop out, if you can get past that, you can almost make it to 100. So, and amazing things happen if you're kind of doing this process. Like Creative Mornings, but without me doing a damn thing, this has become a thing that is like now a phenomenon where people will do the, undertake these things all over the world just as a kind of a, um, therapeutic experience and uh, of how, to, how anyone really can explore their creative side. Um, and then I think also, um, I was a protege when I first got to New York, and I realized that uh, the older I get, the more likely I am to be a protege of the people that I hire to be on my team. And so um, we keep this timeline, of which this is a detail, of every single person that's worked for me since I started at Pentagram in October 1990. And um, um, I'm lucky I've had some people really stay with me a long time. Um, this thing, this is about like the upper two-thirds of it. There's a lot more after that. Um, but um, right now I have a real murderer's row of designers working from me who range from someone who was with me 15 years and claims that in his first week working for me, he went out to Brooklyn to see me give that creative morning talk. He still works with me now. It's amazing. Um, and he heard I was giving, doing this talk and sort of said, uh, um, this is like full circle. Uh, and um, so um, just quickly to kind of like show, Britt Cobb was the guy that was uh, at Creative Mornings back in uh, uh, 15 years ago. So he worked on the Slack logo. Late C. Ho um, helped with the redesign of uh, Poetry Magazine, where we had this thing where every cover could be different. Uh, Elisa Yim is a um, new uh, young designer who um, uh, was an intern who just is, uh, you know, uh, has been working for less than a year for us, something like Brit, 15 years. Uh, John Lumen is uh, a great designer who helped us do the signage at the new edition at the Museum of Natural History. Uh, Yoshi Taralva is a great all-around designer, again, uh, fairly new compared with uh, uh, Late C and Brit, uh, doing amazing work, including uh, the spoke typefaces. Lauren Rush also, um, uh, great color sense, beautiful illustrations. Uh, Johnny Sykov has uh, been with me for some time, and. Uh, um, like me, really loves black and white. Like, like, like he and I often have the idea, like, no matter what the creative brief is, we said, well, what if it was all black and white, you know? And so <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work every time. It works a lot of times. You'd be surprised. Um, and then uh, uh, Sakina Bell, a great designer and great intuitive animator, uh, kind of helped us figure out how to make the logo for the district immediately north of here, Flatiron Nomad, and turn that into something. So I learned so much from each of the these people that I work with. I learn from my partners and I learn from them and your capacity to learn from these people is so important. Oh, I forgot about Chris Guerrero. Anything you see that you like that's been done for Verizon out there and you see a lot of this stuff that's been done for Verizon, any, if you like it, it probably has Chris's fingerprints on it. He's great. Um, but like, you know, um, I remember like really wishing people would knew, would cared about what graphic designers did and now they actually do thanks to the miracle of social media. So. If you really want to do work that people notice and talk about, you have to be prepared for not just the good but the bad. So I just thought I'd throw in Joe's opinion here. This, he's talking about the word Verizon in Helvetica with a red check mark next to it. Now you could say it was boring, but I'm not sure it's abs. And you could say it's garbage. I'm not sure it's absolute garbage. Well, okay, I guess I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, but. What, what I remind myself is that, you know, he, you know, they announced that, that Verizon has a new logo. A lot of people looked at it and said, this thing is awful. It is absolute garbage, perhaps. And they just sort of said that. But it's like, I wasn't designing it for like day one. You're designing something that's going to have to be around for a while. So then I always say, you know, what I learned late in life is that this isn't about make, making a splash when you dive. It's how long you stay above water. And it's like your capacity to just keep swimming. And so I'm very proud of the fact that I've got 
some clients like MIT that I've worked with since 2011, that's 12 years if you're counting. Yale School of Architecture, that's 25 years if you're counting. And then the Architectural League of New York, that is 42 years uh, that we've been working with them. And that sort of says something about endurance or, and as, as uh, Tina put in my bio that got sent out to you, I did marry the first girl I ever kissed and we're still married 43 years later. And so I'm very monogamous, I guess. And I think the thing that actually I draw strength from, and this is, I believe, almost the last lesson, is uh, something that I had trouble articulating, then I found this quote from Maya Angelou. Uh, you are the sum total of everything you've ever seen, heard, eaten, smelled, been told, forgot, it's all there. Then she adds, so be, go out there and try to like smell and eat and hear things that enlarge you as a person. And you sort of realize that as you go along, all the people you meet, all the experience you have, it's all adding up to something. And even though you have the ability to reinvent, and you should reinvent yourself, you can never really jettison all that. That becomes the thing that creates a platform the less you move to the next stage. And so I'll just, uh, one last project. This is two architects that I've known for a long time and like very much, Todd Williams and Billy Chen. They got the assignment to design the, um, uh, um, Barack, uh, the, the Obama Presidential Center in Chicago. And so um, there's um, uh, the president and the first lady looking at the design. You'll notice the design has a part in the tower that has some kind of pattern there. And um, it was decided that as opposed to an abstract pattern, they wanted to have an inscription, like an, almost an abstract treatment of lettering that was a passage from perhaps one of uh, the president's speeches. And so they actually picked out a speech, which is uh, something he said on the anniversary of the Selma March on the Pettus Bridge, uh, uh, which is a beautiful passage. And then one day I got this call, which is, Michael, we have a problem. We don't even know how to explain what it is. And I said, what's the problem? We think it's a, we think it's a graphic design problem. I said, oh, tell me what it is. And he said, well, we've got this type, and we can't figure out how to make it fit exactly in the shape we have for it. <laughs> and I said, Stand back, everybody. <laughs> Mr. President, I'm your man. I know how to do this. <laughs> and so um, uh, when it gets built, it'll look like this. And um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's really, um, uh, it's a beautiful design. And to have a hand in just translating one little part of it into um, something that'll have that sort of permanence is enough to kind of like retire on. So it's never too late. Um, if you're keeping track, I like, I've, been, I joined Pentagram when I was 33 years old. I'm 66 now, so that means I'm 33 years there. I've been working there half my life on Earth. If I really, really take care of myself, maybe I might live to be 99, which means that I've got like one third, one third, and then ahead of me this last third. So I'm at a moment in time where I'm trying to figure out what that last third might be. And I think that's something, you don't have to wait for um, arithmetic to tell you um, how to think about the future. You should do it all the time. It's worth it. And the main thing that you discover as you go along is that um, it is never too late. So the last thing I'll leave you with is something uh, that uh, was said by uh, an Italian guy, not Massimo Vignelli, someone else, Ancoro Imparo, and that means I am still learning. And Michelangelo wrote this on the side of a sketch that he did when he was 87 years old. So thank you. Keep learning. good, right? <laughs> um, we're totally late, but let's do a quick, quick gut check here. Raise your hand if you want to do 10 minutes of Q&A with Michael. It needs to be a lot more than not. Okay, stand up if you want to do Q&A. I can't really see with the arms. Okay. Yes, we're doing Q&A. 10 minutes. Okay. I'm so sorry, Parsons. Oh, uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Or stand up and leave if you and want. And if you need to go, you're totally yeah. cool. Well, people like the concept of Q&A, but the actual... 
<laughs> Who has a question for Michael? We got one here, Tina. Huh? Okay. Hi, Michael. Hi, Zach. Um, I just wanted to know, I know you said it doesn't matter that much, but I have been curious, what is your favorite color and typeface? <laughs> um, that, that, I mean, like, it changes all the time, but um, I, I really, I, like, I come from the school, I think it's a quote by Ivan Shermayev, which is, uh, uh, when in doubt, make it big, if still in doubt, make it red. And he designed that big red nine up on 57th Street, that is proof that that's a good idea. So I like, you know, I like red, I guess. And, um, and you know, um, there are a couple typefaces that sort of tell you how they want you to, tell you what they want you to do with them, and I think that you know Helvetica or Neuhaus Grotesque, as we call it now, is one of those. And I don't think I'd want to do that for the rest of my life. And I neither the color nor the typeface, but they both feel like old friends to me in a way that could represent both um, comfort and a crutch, as uh, or comfort and a, a trap, let's say, not a crutch. And so I think. Growing and learning has to do with both identifying the things you're comfortable with and figuring out how you can kind of sidestep those things and move on to the new thing. So, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, quick question. If you were starting from scratch today, nobody knew who you were, how would you find those good, smart, fun clients? Oh, it, uh, but, you know, all the, like that stuff that we were doing back in the 70s and 80s, there was no internet, there was no nothing. I don't even know how any, I don't know who I knew who Massimo Vignelli was. I don't, I don't, I can't figure out how I knew anything at all back then. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, for one thing, I don't think, um, uh, some of my favorite clients I don't think are necessarily, like, I think there's this idea that if you find a good client, what they are is a patron who encourages you to do good work. And I sort of, I don't need that. I just need someone who sort of has a problem to solve. Massimo used to say, you know, we're like doctors. You know, people come to us and they tell us what hurts and we tell them what, um, you know, what we think the cure is. And he says some designers, they stay, you know, they, they go back in the pharmacy and they say, what color pill do you like? And the client doesn't know what color pill they want. They just say it hurts here, you know, and they want, to, they want whatever will cure that. And so I just need, to me, I don't need people who are kind of, I just need people who have really interesting ailments. <laughs> sort of, you know, and who can describe their symptoms, and I'm like, I've never seen this before, but I think I know what will work. And boy, if you can figure out what will work, that makes me really, really happy. So there, right around you is some problem that needs to be solved. That's what you could look for, as opposed to, uh, and then eventually, if you, put, if you do that good work, someone will see that and say, whoever did that looks like they're a pretty good uh, diagnostician, and I could use their help. So that's, that's my advice. Hey, Michael. Over here. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. So how did you get Verizon to sign off on the Helvetica with the red check? They thought it was garbage, right? No. They, like, what was the tack that you used? No, like, no, no. Yeah. That was, that was Joe from the internet thought it was garbage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, it was other, so um, I think that um, uh, like any client, if you're doing that kind of major change, um, what they did think was, boy, this is going to be complicated. We have all this stuff with the old logo. We have to kind of make a commitment to change to the new logo. And I remember the way I did, I mean, we had a really great, um, smart advocate there, their head of marketing, Diego Scotti. And he came to me and said, I'm not sure I want to change the logo. I just want to do a study to see what, you know, if we changed it, what might it change to? And I said, I like that way of thinking. We're just going to go experiment. So that was one of the experiments we did. We didn't, you know, and I didn't say, unless you change it to this, you know, I'm going to be angry. And I didn't, I didn't even sell it that hard. We both agreed that the logo they had at that point really wasn't working. It sort of had lots of lots, lots of different, you know, some people thought it was actually ugly, but I think that's a matter of opinion. Um, what it was was very dysfunctional in terms of how it was, op how it was operationalized in a way. And so I said, what you really need is something that is you know, you're not looking for surprise or amusement from a wireless provider. You just want something that looks strong, simple, and reliable, right? And so your current logo, if, if anyone remembers the old logo, it sort of had, it was Helvetica and sort of had some check marky sort of thing in it. And I said, I think this is supposed to be a check mark, which is a cool thing to own. This is Helvetica, except it's got all this jazz happening with it. What if we just kind of, kind of shook it out and played it straight and just kind of like presented to find of like a nice, happy, but straight, clean complexion of the world. And uh, um, that was one of the 
outcomes of that experiment, and they showed it. He showed it around uh, to leadership, and they said, "Let's do this thing." And then we were off. So, it's, it's, I, mean, I, I don't try to sell people things they don't want. I always feel like, you know, if um, if you've got if, if you're like really sick and you prefer to just keep throwing up instead of taking the pill that I've got, you know. <laughs> People, I, I'm not going to criticize your hobbies, you know. So, uh, um, so you know, it's, I think it's always up to the client to kind of do the right thing. We just have to make the case. Uh, we have to explain to them why we think it's the right thing, and hope that that logic will be compelling in and of itself. You're welcome. Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Mars. Um, uh, so I never got to go to portfolio school or design school. Like, went to kind of a shitty public university in the Midwest. But I love learning, yeah. and I love students. And I'm leading a workshop for high school students later this month to help them discover like their interest in like the creative <clears throat> fields and advertising. What advice do you think I should give like a hundred teenagers who kind of just don't know what they want to do? <coughs> um, that's a great question. And I went to a public high school, a public university in the Midwest that uh, I managed to get, a, I think, a good education at. But um, for years, when my kids were looking for colleges, it wasn't even any, it wasn't in, it wasn't listed in their book of 500 top colleges and universities. Dad, where did you go? It's not in this book. Okay, so. <coughs> um, good question. And so, I mean, I, I actually think you could short circuit the laborious beginning of my story and just say, look, there's this stuff all around you which is having an impact on culture. And for them, it might be, you know, it could be, you know, um, it could be a fashion logo. It could be an Instagram meme. It could be, um, you know, uh, you know, a sticker. It could be, you know, it could be all. It could be, uh, you know, we're surrounded. Like it's funny. Graphic design is. We've become such a visual culture compared to the way it was, say, 50 years ago, where we navigate with emojis, we navigate with iconography. That I think actually just sort of like saying, you know, design. What's, what would your personal icon be? What would it look like if you were an app button on your phone? How would you launch you? You know, I mean, to me, it's just just give a nice open thing that would let them do that with like. Um, you know, low requirement, where there's no big requirement of being able to master, you know, drawing tools or anything else, but just something where it makes them think about how do I translate an idea into a visual expression. Something like that would actually be a fun thing, I think. I would have loved that back in the day. Okay, we want to have the pictures too, yeah. We, ha we have to end it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can we give Michael another really wonderful round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Michael, I can't wait to have you back when you're 99. Um, all right, let's do the pitch real quickly. The four of you that we called out earlier, come on up. You get 30 seconds to pitch whatever you want to pitch to this lovely audience. <clears throat> There we go. Come up on either side works. Or this side. You can come right up on stage. Hi. All right, are you ready? Sure. You can start us off. Okay. Hi, I'm Jacqueline. Um, so I got into dance about two years ago after not dancing for a long time. And now I teach absolute beginner classes to anyone who's like nervous or intimidated to go to dance class. And Creative Mornings is such an amazing community and I have so much fun here and you all are such great people that I was thinking it'd be fun to do a dance class um, for free for anyone who's interested um, and wants to dance together and I'd create choreo for you all. Um, so if you're interested, I'll put it on Teams and you can always say hi to me afterwards. And, and everyone, we're gonna share everyone's pictures in the follow-up email, so pictures, please don't leave. Casey's gonna write down all of your information. Hi everyone, my name is Justine Clay and I am a business coach and ADHD life coach for creative entrepreneurs and freelancers. So I have two things to share. If you are a creative of any neurotype who is looking to build a more efficient, fulfilling and profitable creative business or career, we should talk. And also I am doing a field trip next week for Creative Mornings. It is next Tuesday and it's called Business Strategies for ADHD Creatives. It was very popular last time I ran it, and you do not have to have ADHD to come. There is something for everybody. It's awesome. So please sign up there and join me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dev. I'm a student currently at the Parsons School of Design. And 
I know the how to book has helped me a lot in the way I think about design as a problem solver than someone that works with colors and type. And so um, right now I'm in my junior year and I've been looking for internships in product design, like digital product design. And I'm a 3D visual artist, so it's like always a tough time kind of branding myself. But uh, that's me, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Cheers. I have some good news and some bad news. Um, some context, my name is Aidan, I'm 20, I'm from the UK. I'm also the manager of the Creativity Conference, which, like Creative Mornings, helps to share for free the joy of being a creative and learning from the wisdom of amazing luminaries from the creative industries. The bad news is that we just finished one uh, yesterday. Uh, it was online, it was free, it was amazing. The good news is if you sign up, it's totally free, just first name, last name, email address, you can get all the replays for free, so check out the website, etc. Also, unrelated, if you're a filmmaker and you go to film festivals, get in touch with me, because I helped to organize the Cannes Pajama Party and pajama parties elsewhere around the world, which is just hilariously fun. And finally, can we just get one big happy birthday for Creative Mornings? All right, happy birthday in three, two, one. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. You can go to the right over there. Thank you. Also, extra props for the banana shirt. I don't know if you saw it in the back. There's bananas on his shirt. All right. I know we're totally on Swiss late. A few thank yous, and I'm going to let you go. Without our volunteers, these events would not run as smoothly. So thank you, Ella, Sissy, Megan, Romaine, Esmeritas, Kelly, Ryan, Alicia, Kelsey, Emily, and Leah. We love you. Thanks to Connie and Monty. You can see how good you looked at this event. Connie is filming these events for years on end. Monte took photos of you. And then thanks to our live stream team, there were people who were able to tune in and see this live. Thank you, Kevin, Matthew, and Isabella. You can hire these folks, by the way. And then I also want to give an extra, extra loving shout out to my HQ team for helping me steward this beautiful ship that is Creative Mornings. And Colin, Celestine, Angelica, Amanda, Exa, Krista, Casey, and Brian, I love you all. And next month, we're going to have Meg Lewis on November 17th. She's an incredibly fun and quirky and just wonderfully um, authentic designer. I adore this woman so much. So. Uh, get ready for that. It's going to be a CUNY on Fifth Avenue. And then as always, I want to leave you with a quote. Despair is a failure of the imagination by Wade Davis. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making this what it is. And see you next month.